Hi, good uh, afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I really cannot stand the heat. I have never talked in uh, this kind of temperature. If I have a heat stroke before I finish, you can finish the talk on YouTube, okay? <laughs> All right. So, yeah, what I do is um, I have a blog called Vegan Strategist. I'm a co-founder of ProVeg. I'm together with Melanie Joy giving trainings for SIVA, and I'm also um, involved with the Effective Altruist movement. This is the book I wrote uh, called also How to Create a Vegan World, and it is meant to be a book about strategy. It is not a book that tells you why people should go vegan, but it's about how we can achieve this vegan ideal that I think we all share. This vegan ideal, you see. Um, an ideal of a completely plant-based world where, where animals are not harmed in any way. And in the book, I explain the strategy by means of a metaphor. And I explain that what we, as a vegan movement, and if you are not vegan today here in the audience, if you're not all vegan, that's perfectly fine. But what, I, what we want to do is to get as many people as possible, ideally all people, to live in a village that I call Veganville, that is situated on top of a mountain. Why is it on top of a mountain? Because it is still a bit hard to get there. It is still a bit hard to become vegan, right? And I talk about what the situation is today that's getting our bearings. I talk about the call to action, which is what should we say or shout? What should our message be to get as many as people, many, as pe many people as possible to start the trek towards Veganville? And an argument is about like how do we motivate them for making that trek? Is it with animal arguments or with environmental arguments or whatever? Environment is about how can we create an environment during this trip that makes it easier for people to continue on this journey. So that's by creating alternatives, by creating restaurants and resting places in this case. And then support is about talking to people in a way that motivates them that makes them enthusiastic rather than makes them feel guilty. And finally, sustainability means once people are in Veganville, how do we make sure that they don't walk back down? Because as you know, that happens as well. There are vegans or vegetarians who at some point go back to eating meat. How can we avoid that? That is the strategy that I set out in the book. Today I'm going to talk about something else. I'll talk about four ingredients that I think this movement needs and needs more of in order to create this vegan world. And these are open-mindedness, empathy, rationality, and positivity. Okay, let's go over these. And these are values that not just the vegan movement needs, but that the world at large can use as well. And that would make conversations and relationships a lot more productive and effective because right now the state of public dialogue and public conversation is a bit uh, like this. I'm right, you are an idiot. Do you recognize that on Facebook, how we communicate? People give their opinion and there's a thousand people telling them they're idiots, right? So that's not the attitude that we want, not in the vegan movement and not in the world at large. So first of all, open-mindedness. What do I mean with open-mindedness for vegans? So you have been, all of you who are vegan today, have been meat eaters at some point, right? There are some exceptions. Anybody here who is a lifelong vegan? They are very rare. They are still very rare. Maybe you can make a baby tonight. <laughs> That's a lifelong vegan. But right now they are still rare. So. You were a meat eater once, and you were what I call, you were living in a box, in a box that we can call, with Melanie Joy's word, carnism. And you were living comfortably in that box. You were not questioning your diet. You were just eating like everybody else did. And all of a sudden, you became a little bit restless in that box. See, it moves a little bit. And then the light went on, and the box opened, and you jumped out as a vegetarian or a vegan. And suddenly, you knew better, right? And suddenly, you learned about all these wonderful benefits that a vegan diet had. And you started maybe to be actually become an activist or an advocate for veganism. 
and you were no longer in the box. You were outside of the carnage box. You had freed yourself from that ideology that we call carnism. But maybe if you are like me again, you ended up in another box. And can you guess what that box is? It's the box of veganism. And that might very well function as another system that limits your thinking. Because it is an ideology again, and because there's a lot of groupthink going on, and because there's a lot of people thinking we should not question anymore. And maybe the dynamic was a bit like this. I was so, so wrong before when I was eating meat. And now that I've changed, I am so, so right. And that's why I don't need to question anymore. But I think that's wrong. So I think it is quite easy to end up in the vegan box. And you can recognize that you are in the vegan box when you have fixed answers to things like these. Veganism is this. You're not vegan if you do this. Vegans are that. You have to communicate about veganism in this way. It's, I think, perfectly illustrated by this cartoon here. This guy says, I'm mostly vegan, but... And the other one says, if there's a but, you're not vegan. Can you recognize that? It's the idea that we should no longer question things. And I think that is wrong. To be perfectly clear, if you're in a box, it's better to be in this box than in this box. Right? But it is still better not to be in any box at all. The way I say this is, being vegan means giving up animal products. It does not mean giving up thinking. Thinking is vegan. You are allowed to think. If you don't think, you are subject to dogma. You know what dogma is? Dogma is the idea that there are fixed, forever answers to certain questions. And what is the problem with dogma? The problem with dogma is that we cannot improve. And we need to improve all the time. We need to improve getting better and better at this vegan thing, this vegan advocacy, because the challenge is so incredibly high, so incredibly big. We have to get better and better at it. We have to improve. So to check with yourself if you're open-minded on any topic, you can, answer, you can ask some questions to yourself. Have I thought about this thoroughly? Is there any information that I'm missing? Or do I have everything? Do I know everything? Most of the time that is not true. Do I have any biases? You know biases, prejudices, like confirmation bias. Have you heard of that? Confirmation bias means that you're going to look for the information that confirms the opinion you already have. And something I call slow opinion. Practicing slow opinion means that you're going to be slow in forming an opinion. You're going to say when somebody has an opinion that you maybe don't agree with, you're going to say, well, I'm going to postpone my judgment, I'm going to postpone forming an opinion, and I'm going to be slow. I'm going to ask you, can you give me some more information? I'm going to say to you, I need some more time to develop an opinion on this. This is the opposite of what we're seeing today, especially on social media. We're developing opinions very, very fast, right? So let me practice this with you, and maybe... I'll lose the whole audience right now with this example because it's a triggering example. But what about GMOs, genetically modified organisms? I don't want to make any propaganda for this, but what I want you to do is to think about your opinion on these things. You know, in our movement, many people are against them. And I used to be against them until I wondered why. Am I against them? Is it because I have thoroughly investigated this topic? The answer was no. The answer was, I'm against that because everybody around me is against that. Everybody in my peer group is against it, so I'm supposed to be against it, apparently. And then I discovered a website called vegangmo.com, and that's a website not by the pharmaceutical industry, but by some vegans who believe that with this technology, they can make the world a better place for animals. Do you have to be entirely pro or against GMOs? I don't think so, but I think a more nuanced attitude towards them would be helpful and healthy. Just as an example 
of slow opinion. The second principle or value is empathy. I think we vegans are really good at empathy. This is uh, Anita Krines, who you may know from the Toronto Save Movement. And she was, at a certain point, um, sued, brought before trial, because she was giving water to a pig while these pigs were waiting in the heat in front of the slaughterhouse. And they sued her. And fortunately, she was acquitted. She was not found guilty. But the thing is that I think this is a nice, iconic picture of the empathy that we have for animals. And I'm saying very clearly for animals. Because the people who are here in the box or not, but the vegans, they are finding it usually very easy to have empathy for pigs and cows and chickens, but how easy is it for us to have empathy for meat eaters or for hunters or for, God forbid, bullfighters? Do you have any empathy for them? And should we have any empathy for them? Maybe you say, what, empathy for these people? Seriously? <laughs> this is Gary Yurovsky, who is not known for his empathy for people. Let me contrast him for a second with another animal advocate or vegan advocate. Does anybody know him? Thich Nhat Han, yes? Thich Nhat Han is a, a Buddhist monk, and he is very monk, monkey-like in his outreach. He is very calm and gentle and compassionate, and he also talks about veganism. And I'm not saying that this approach would be always wrong or this one always right. But what I am saying is that probably empathy is appropriate in almost any situation for almost anybody. And again, maybe you think, no, no, no. There's people so horrible that empathy is inappropriate. Can you think of people so horrible that we should not feel any empathy at all towards them? Maybe these guys, white supremacists, pretty disgusting people. And you might say empathy, no, not appropriate. Now, if you think that way, let me introduce you to this guy, Daryl Davis. He's a black activist, and he was um, living in the 70s. He was living outside of the U.S. because his father was a kind of a diplomat. And he got back to the U.S., when um, in, the, in, the, in a period when there was a lot of racism, much more so still than today. And he was walking around in a 4th of July parade in the 1970s. And all of a sudden, people were throwing things at him. He was the only black kid in this parade. People were throwing cans and dirt and trash at him. And he said this was the first time in his life that he experienced racism. And he asked himself the question, how can these people hate me if they don't even know me? How can they hate me if they don't even know me? And that made him realize that he didn't know them either. He didn't know these people either. And he said, I should know them. I should, I want to understand them. And that's what he tried to do. He got, he built relationships with these people. And sometimes it was dangerous and there were guns involved, but he managed to talk to quite a few of them. And what happened as a result was that about 200 people, 200 people of the Klux clan told him after their relationship with him that they were giving up their beliefs, that they were giving up their nasty racist ideology. And as a proof of that, as a symbol of that, they gave him their Ku Klux Klan robes. He collects these robes as a kind of trophy to show how many people he has changed their mind. Right? And so, yeah, if you want to see a documentary about him, Accidental Courtesy on Netflix. I don't know if it's in Germany as well. So what he did was, he had empathy, Daryl Davis. He had an open mind. He was listening and asked questions. He built rapport. He built a connection with these people. And he tried to understand them. And that's very hard to do. This is a tall order. 
to do that with these kind of people. But I'm just saying that I think it's appropriate. I think if you can do it, it's great because this might be the only way to change people's mind, to build a relationship with them, to approach them, to talk to them, to try to understand them, to treat them as people, and to hopefully change them. It's probably going to be faster than by just isolating them and pushing them away, which might feel good, but not necessarily do much good. So to be more empathic, some tips to be more empathic in this movement, the first one is to understand the situation that we're in. There's many answers to this question. Why do most people eat meat? My answer to that question is most people eat meat because most people eat meat. People do what other people do. It's the norm today. It's the way of least resistance. And if you are vegan today, that makes you special. That makes you, what we call in marketing, innovators or early adopters. Have you ever seen this model? It's the diffusion of innovation model that we usually use to explain the adoption of new technology. For instance, cell phones. If you don't have a cell phone yet, a smartphone yet today, in 2019, you would be here with a very slow people. You may be fast in other domains. In the domain of food, if you're vegan today, you're all here. You're an innovator or an early adopter. And you have to understand and you have to accept that other people will be slower. They will be slower in adopting this new technology or this new habit. And that is just the way it is. And you can fight and you can shout. But not everybody is going to have the same speed as you have. It doesn't mean we have to be advocates. It doesn't mean we have to do action. But we have to accept there will be a difference. So in a way, the ones who are vegan today are the low-hanging fruit. The people who want to make a sacrifice. The people who want to make an effort. I believe that almost everybody cares to some extent about animals. But maybe they don't care enough to make a sacrifice. You made that sacrifice for which you have to be congratulated except that other people don't want to make that sacrifice and try to make the environment more conducive to their change so that their sacrifice becomes lower. The sacrifice that they have to make, the effort that you have to make becomes lower. Secondly, understand that you never have all the info about another person. You never are able to understand what it is like to be them entirely. You never know what is happening in a certain situation. I sometimes, let me give you an example, I sometimes can be very angry in traffic. For instance, when somebody passes me by at 150 kilometers an hour, and I go like, fucker, because that's dangerous and I just get worked up around it. And then what helps me is thinking, well, maybe I don't know the whole situation. Maybe this guy is on the road to the hospital to visit his dying grandmother. And that is probably not true. But it helps me right away to calm down. And I can advise this, recommend this technique for everybody. It's not going to work all the time. If they're passing you like this, they're not on the way to the hospital, probably. And thirdly, remember that empathy worked. Remember that guy, Daryl Davis, who was successful in changing these white supremacists. So if you want to be effective, empathy can be a really strong part of your strategy. Thirdly, rationality. Rationality in our movement is sometimes lacking. Sometimes I think, for instance, we exaggerate our claims. Right? Have you ever heard a vegan exaggerate things a little bit? For instance, what the health, a documentary, many people say the claims for health, for vegan health, for the benefits of a vegan diet are exaggerated. I think that doesn't help us if we exaggerate our cause. Our cause is strong enough without us having to exaggerate it. And we will not be credible with the people who matter most, the people who think and the people who make decisions. They want us to present a credible case, not an exaggerated case. 
If we present veganism as a solution for everything, that's what I call vegalomania. You know, saying that veganism will solve everything. Another example of irrationality is in this field. When McDonald's or Burger King offers a vegan burger finally, after all these years, and so many vegans are angry with that. And I see them commenting online, I hate them, and uh, McDonald's is McDeath, and I don't even go there to pee in their toilets. You know? They completely want to, wi they wish McDonald's out of existence. But that's not going to happen. The only thing that's going to happen is that McDonald's gradually transforms to a more sustainable and a better and a more compassionate company. They're not going to go bankrupt from today on tomorrow, and they're not going to become a vegan company overnight. So it has to go slow. There is no other way. And you can shout and you can scream. I don't think that's going to help. And the biggest aspect of irrationality in our movement, I think, is when we talk about purity, when we talk about what is vegan and what is not. Why is that irrational? Because we're focusing on details and we're scaring people away. Let me introduce you quickly to three ideas. 100% vegan doesn't exist. 99% vegan can call themselves a vegan, as far as I'm concerned. And there is such a thing as a 95% vegan. This is controversial. Many people shoot me for it or want to shoot me for it. But try to keep an open mind. 100% vegan, what is that? It's hard to exactly say what that is. This is a spectrum of animal ingredients going from big to smaller. And you might be a vegan that says, veganism or being a vegan means avoiding all animal products all the time. So also these very, very tiny products. Then I would say to you, have you read this book? So here it says, the book is called Veganissimo, one who is vegan to the highest possible standard. A very, very high standard vegan. That's a Veganissimo. Right? And this book contains 300 pages of ingredients that are of animal origin or maybe of animal origin. And I could say to you, I have studied this book by heart and I apply it. Are you? Are you? Then you're not a vegan. Right? So the thing is, for every vegan we can find, there's another vegan who is more vegan. And that is a silly game to play. You can be so vegan that you don't watch Kevin Bacon movies. Right? That is not what we should be about. I think we should be about impact. These ladies here, they are vegans. They are vegan, except for when they find something in the trash that is non-vegan, they will eat it. I'm fine with them calling themselves vegan. They have What they're doing there has no impact on demand, right? It's They're eating something that is going to be thrown away. Whatever. Let them do and let them call themselves vegan. On the other way around, we have to realize that not all our vegan products are great in every sense. What could be wrong with chocolate? What could be wrong with it? Child labor? Deforestation, other things. It uses a lot of water, unfortunately. So, sorry, chocolate here. Chocolate can be very problematic foods, even though it might be vegan. It can contain palm oil, whatever. Right? So don't think because you are vegan that you're perfect, obviously. Second idea, 95% vegan. My message is here, just it exists. Why do I say that? Because many people say, no, there is no such thing as a 95% vegan. V being vegan is like being pregnant. You are pregnant or you're not. You are vegan or you're not. I think that is a very binary way of approaching things that is not very helpful. Why not let people say, why not allow them to say that they're 95% or 90% vegan, just like the raw food people? You know, the raw food people, they say, I'm 80% raw, 85% raw. I think that's useful. It indicates how they eat, 
and it shows that also they are making a very significant effort. And the effort of these people counts as well. Altogether, they have a big impact on reducing animal suffering. I explain that more in my book. And thirdly, the 99% vegan, the most controversial idea here. So imagine there's a vegan who goes to her grandmother twice a year, and she eats cookies there, cookies that her grandmother made, and grandmother does not understand veganism. This vegan has tried to explain it to her grandmother, but she keeps making those cookies. And this vegan says, well, what the hell, my grandmother is going to die anytime, and I'm just going to eat those cookies. And I still call myself a vegan. Who would we be to tell that person, you're not part of the club? Would that be productive? Would that be useful for any reason? I don't think so. Here's another example. Suppose you go to a business lunch with a big group of people, and you call beforehand, you say, I want a vegan lunch. And at the moment it arrives, they put it on your table in front of you, and you taste it, and you say, that. That's like bitter that I taste. It doesn't taste vegan. Now, one vegan may say, I'll send it back to the waiter. I ask something else, dump it, throw it in the trash. Another vegan might say, I'm just going to eat it. I don't want to be, I don't want it to be thrown away. And also, maybe I don't want to make a fuss. I don't want to have 20 people saying like, oh my God, that's this really difficult, this vegan thing. And you get into socially awkward situations, etc." So these are two ways to approach veganism and being vegan. And the only thing I suggest is let us be accepting of a certain variation in how people are vegan. In how they are, in how they practice, in how they live veganism. That's all. Can we do that? I think we can do that. We can accept a tiny variation. Then we don't have to fight about these things anymore. Put it another way, if this is the number of meals that you eat, in a year, in a life, sorry, in a year, 1,075 meals, three meals a day. And one of these meals, imagine one of these meals, this one here, is not vegan. Suppose it still has some potatoes and some vegetables, but part of it is not vegan. If you ate like that, then you would be vegan for 99.7%. I say that's vegan enough. That's vegan enough to be part of Team Vegan, right? Let's not make a fuss about that. I'm not worried about confused waiters, you know, like, oh, the waiters is going to be confused if you're, like, not very clear about the definition. Not worried about that. I'm not worried about watering down veganism. I'm not worrying, worried about getting only to a 98% vegan world. If we get there, that would already be amazing. But the important thing is, if we get there, the final 2% will take care of itself. No problem. What I am worried about is people saying, what the fuck is this? Is this a religion? I can't understand this. This is not, this is, I can't do this. Or I'm also worried about alienating vegans. You know, I see so many people. And they say, I was a member of this Facebook group, and they threw me out, or I left because I said something and they criticized me. They said I was not a real vegan. Let's just leave that behind. I'm worried about people going back to being a non-vegan. One of the reasons why people go back, one of the reasons that they say they go back is because they think it's too difficult. But it is only as difficult as we want to make it. You want to make it very difficult? You want to have a thousand rules? Or you want to make it just a bit difficult? Or you want to make it easy? I think it should be as easy as possible so that we don't make a small group of people even smaller. So forget about black and white, but think of veganism as a spectrum. Think of it as vegans here, and non-vegans here, and all kinds of people in between. They should not call themselves vegan if they eat a steak every week, but they're still strategically very important because they are improving demand, increasing demand, and it's thanks to them thanks to all these reducers, that today we have all these options. The companies are not making food for that 1 or 2% of vegans. 
they're making food for the 30% of meat producers. That's the interesting demographic. So we have to be thankful to them, even if they're not entirely there. So if you look at it like this, the impact you can have on helping animals and on reducing animal suffering, the impact that you can have with your own consumption is relatively small compared to the impact that you can have on what other people eat through your activism, through maybe your entrepreneurship, through the way you advocate. So let me give you a quote from the Bible that is exceptionally true. What goes into your mouth is less important than what comes out of it. This does not mean you should not be vegan. Be as vegan as you can. But remember that the impact you may have on other people may be much bigger. For instance, celebrities, they influence sometimes millions of people. Maybe they're not entirely vegan. And then they get criticized by vegans. But then I ask those vegans, when is the last time you were able to influence 3 million people? Probably never, right? So being an activist, being an advocate for animals is really important. And you can do that in all kinds of ways. You can participate in street demonstrations of animal groups, but also donations are activism. Giving something to an animal organization so that they can have more means to do more work and help more animals. Or being an entrepreneur, starting a business, doing something with food is also activism. Or maybe you're a bit more lazy and you don't want to leave your chair, but you're a good chef. You can take really nice pictures of the food you make and put them on Instagram and influence people and show them how great the vegan lifestyle can be. Only nice pictures, nothing like this, okay? It's not because you made it that it looks good. It's like with babies. Okay? <laughs> Finally, positivity. So, I think we should be more like dogs. Dogs are optimistic and positive. And I think in the words of Immanuel Kant, optimism is a moral duty. Why? Because I think with optimism we can do more we can be more sustainable and we can reach more people. We can recruit more people to this movement. On the other hand, we should not be naive. Not everything is going to be okay. Sometimes we have to fight, sometimes we have to resist. And being positive in this world is not easy, especially for us who get confronted with animal suffering all the time. And we get confronted with people who seem entirely indifferent. How easy is it for you to have some empathy or to feel some positivity about this guy? It is very, very difficult. One thing that helps me is this quote, those who deserve love the least need it the most. What we do today is the opposite. When somebody has made a mistake, we pull away all our love and all our support we put them inside of four walls and we think we're going to make things better like that. It should be the opposite. It should be when people make a mistake, we give them support. That can make things better, not isolating them. One other way to be positive about humans is to think, them in another, think of them in another way that you're used to. This is a still from a, from a movie that's called La Belle Verte, a French movie. It's about an alien species that is enlightened on another planet, in another constellation. And now and then, they undertake missions towards other planets to civilize them, to get them to a higher level. And one day, their leader asks them, who wants to go to Earth? And all these aliens go like, no, not Earth, because Earth is a very primitive planet. The one brave woman decides she wants to go to Earth. And on Earth, everybody she meets, everybody she has a confrontation with, will be changed because of meeting that alien. And one of the people that she meets is this woman who's just leaving a butcher's, butcher shop. 
and the alien sees her leaving the butchery and she asks, what did you do in there? And the woman says, I bought meat. And the alien asks her, meat? Why did you buy meat? And the woman says, like, well, to eat, of course, it's food. Are you crazy? And the alien says, you eat animal? And then she walks away. But this woman has been impacted by the alien. And she drops down on the pavement, and she takes the meat from the package, and she looks at it like that, not knowing what she's doing with it. And I think this is symbolic for us, for humans. And the way to look at humans is not just seeing horrible people who do horrible things every day, but maybe another way to look at them is to see them as the first species to question our own diet. And that is a wonderful thing. That we are in a position, evolutionary, where we say, maybe the thing that we are eating is not our ideal food. Maybe it's bad, maybe it's cruel. I think that's a very beautiful thing to have arrived at. We have a long history behind us, and we have just recently, in cosmological terms, very, very recently, developed art and science and morality and spirituality. And we have a lot of time, potentially, to develop these further. There is no reason to think that our future must be negative. We can become, I think, great beings who can help all the animals. Now, I'll finish with this. If you don't buy my optimism, and if tonight, after this wonderful party here, you would again see a horrible video on your Facebook feed, and you think, humans are horrible, then one thing you can do is go to Google, and you enter pictures to restore your faith in humanity. Pictures to restore your faith in humanity. And then you will find pictures like this one. A man giving water to a koala in a forest fire. Or these guys saving a sheep from drowning in a river. Or these cops in Japan helping a duck across the street. Or finally, my favorite example, this fireman giving a cat back to his person. And you see that the cat is not very impressed. But what you can also see is the emotion on this woman's face. How happy she is to have her cat back. And I know this is not a chicken or a pig or a cow. And she may very well be eating pork or cow's meat or chicken meat at home that very night. But at least she loves this animal. She loves a creature of another species. I think we should also always remember that, that we are capable of that, because that is something that can give us hope, and I think that's a great place to start. Thank you very much.